Good morning, everyone. Everybody at the table. So this morning is Workshop Sunday, and so I'm going to try and do as little speaking as possible. And everything hopefully will happen around the table. And so I'll just wait for Tumi to set up his uh, stuff. He's uh, fulfilling uh, 45 jobs this morning. Be patient with him. <laughs> Thank you, Tumi. <clears throat> Projector. Thank you. <laughs> so this morning's topic, um, when Craig and I were having this conversation a couple of weeks ago, um, he had initially asked me if I would consider doing this workshop, and my first response was no. You know that answer, Wilma. Mm. <laughs> um, and I had, and so the topic that I'm going to address this morning is there's a number of people in our country that has the expertise to do this, and by no means do I consider myself an expert in the topic, but these group, these teams of people are people I work with when we address this type of thing in our country. And as it would happen, all of the people I approach it, no, you can do it. <laughs> so this morning, my challenge to you is that as you're sitting here, that you allow God to speak to you, to engage. And there are going to be times where you're actually going to be uncomfortable. And so I'm making that disclaimer up front. It's going to be a bit uncomfortable. And so what Craig and I spoke about was the topic around cultural intelligence. Now that's a lot of big words. But for this morning, I chose the, the topic as beloved community. And so this morning, we're going, to, we're going to go between beloved community and cultural intelligence. Okay, move to the next slide. So September is Heritage Month, if you didn't know that. <laughs> Tomorrow is, who is it today? What's the day? The 24th. Today is Heritage Day. And so this is a quote from one of my friends, Quentin Pretorius, that he put out on social media this week. And he said, September marks Heritage Month in South Africa to celebrate our nation's rich cultural diversity. In a country renowned for its myriad of cultures, language, and traditions, embracing this diversity isn't just about honoring our past. It's a vital step towards a more inclusive future. And so you'll notice I'm going to start off with a whole bunch of quotes that's going to prick your... Tell me the next slide, please. This was a quote attributed to Martin Luther King Jr. He says, Sunday morning remains the most segregated hour. He made this quote in 1960s during the Civil Rights Movement. That quote remains true today. In South Africa, we remain on a Sunday morning the most divided community at church. And you might say, why would you say that? Another quote by Ed Stetzer. Ed Stetzer runs a, a research organization in the U.S. And he makes this statement and he says, people like the idea of diversity. They just don't like being around different people. It's a tongue-in-cheek statement. And so we'll test it this morning. And so Simon read us, and this is where I'm asking you to, for those of you who have Bibles, we're going to engage a specific scripture this morning, and we're going to interrogate not just the scripture, but also test our own biases this morning. As much as we say that we are community ministries, we are loving community, Guess what? We're not so loving at times. 
Let's read from Philippians chapter 2, verse 1. It says, Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from His love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Verse 3. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. Not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interest of the others. And verse 5. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. On the first way of reading it, it sounds simple enough. And so this morning we're going to test the simplicity of that scripture and where we find ourselves in that scripture. Next slide. So the first question we're going to engage this morning. So I coined this phrase, beloved community. Be key to see at your table the next five minutes. And I'm not going to ask for report backs. Because there's later on <laughs> in the session, I want to see how we engage that scripture. So the first question is, what is the beloved community? And yeah, I'm not expecting you to give me a fancy answer, but I just want to test to see if you know what the beloved community means for you around your table. So in five minutes, you've got pens and paper. Go ahead and discuss. What is the beloved community? Okay, time. I hope that stimulated your, your brains to around what the concept of beloved community. And so this morning, we are actually going to interrogate and focus on a very specific verse that will help us define the pillars for beloved community this morning. Okay, move to the next slide. And so the term beloved community uh, is a term that was first coined in the early days of the 20th century by the philosopher and theologian. Yes, a philosopher can be a theologian and a theologian can be a philosopher. <laughs> uh, Josiah Royce, who founded the Fellowship of Reconciliation. However, it was Martin Luther King Jr., also a member of the Fellowship of Reconciliation, who popularized the term and invested it with a deeper meaning which has captured the imagination of people of goodwill all over the world. And you must understand that during the 60s in the US, that it was a very divided society. There were lynchings, there were killings of black people, even in churches. And so, what undergirded or what caused Martin Luther King to actually coin the phrase the beloved community despite the killings that were happening? And in fact, he says that our responsibility as believers, the ones who follow the way, is to help not just the oppressed, but to help the oppressor and set their minds free. And so to further give you some thoughts on that, he says he believed the beloved community was not devoid of interpersonal group or international conflict. He recognized that conflict is an inevitable part of human experience. But he also believed that conflicts could be resolved peacefully. And so his entire methodology was based around nonviolence. And many people did not like that. He says, no conflict he believed need erupt in violence. And the next one. He says, the end is reconciliation. The end is redemption. 
The end is the creation of the beloved community. It is this type of spirit and this type of love that can transform opponents into friends. It is this type of understanding, goodwill, that will transform the deep gloom of the old age into the exuberant gladness of the new age. It is this love which will bring about miracles in the hearts of men and women. Don't worry, we can send you the PowerPoint slides afterwards. You don't have to write feverishly. And so let's go and look at the definition of beloved. Be interesting to hear um, if those who, who took the entire thing of beloved community you actually broke it down to understand what does beloved mean? Does anybody care to, to uh, offer an opinion or view of what beloved means? Nurtures? Anyone else? Dearly loved? Treasured? Anyone? Going, going, gone. Yes, just set apart. Okay. And so all of you are not wrong. <laughs> it encompasses all of those things. And so basically, a beloved person is one who is dearly loved. Deep affection for each other. In the New Testament, the use of the word beloved implies more than human affection. It suggests an esteem for others that comes from recognizing their worth as children of God. So that gives you an insight into how Martin Luther King Jr. saw even though violence was there every day, he still recognized the worth of every person. The one who was oppressed, deeply affected by the trauma of violence, but he also saw the worth of the one who perpetrated the violence. It sounds a lot like Jesus, doesn't it? The worth of everyone and see them as children of God. Let's look at the next one. Definition of community. Anyone care to throw up uh, their version of community definition? Those around you. Okay. Togetherness. Okay. Mm -hmm. Common ground. It's in Cape Town. <laughs> <laughs> There's actually a church called Common Ground. <laughs> okay. Again, the answers. Sorry, who was here? Morgan. See, the interesting word is common. And so, a community is a social unit wherein members share a common network. So, the word is common. Common networks that unite communities include networks of values, culture, interests, goals, and kinship. So what types of communities do we have? Anybody care to? <laughs> types of communities. You like the next slide? Sure. So communities of place. A place defines community. Communities of interest. Identity-based communities. Communities of need. Communities of practice. And communities of convenience. Interestingly, communities of place. If you look at our history in South Africa, the Group Areas Act actually separated people who used to live together. And now we live with the effects and the trauma of displaced people's identities of communities who actually don't see each other. I want you to keep that in mind. And we're going to talk about it a bit later. Convenience. This is a community of convenience because I forced you to sit around tables. 
Yes, at my convenience. <laughs> <laughs> All convenience is, when COVID happened, everybody was forced to experience lockdown and you all shared the same inconvenience. So you can interpret it any way you want to. It's both negative and a positive. The next slide. The author Heather Zempel observes, community is messy because it always involves people. And people are messy. It's about people hauling their brokenness and baggage into your house and dumping it into your living room. We also bring our stories, our backgrounds, our culture, our likes, even our dislikes, our biases, our superiority, our inferiority, our insecurities, our trauma, our fear of the other. And dare I say, some of us are sitting with deep trauma of our history and experience of our past, including our current reality, as we sit here. And so, as I've laid the foundation, as we're about to engage the scripture, there's, a, there's two words in Philippians chapter 2. That we're going to focus on. It speaks about valuing others or the other. And the verse following that speaks about in the interest, in the best interest of the other. And so at your table, I want you to grapple with the question, who is the other? Are you able to actually identify who the other is? I remember I was in a, at a church service one day and the pastor spoke about this particular passage and I couldn't help myself. I put up my hand and I said, who is the other? And we weren't able to engage it. And so at your tables, I actually want you to ask yourself the question around the table, who is the other? Whether it's in your community, whether it's at community ministries, whether it's in wherever it is that you find yourself that you engage people. Who is the other that Jesus is referring to or Paul is referring to in that scripture? So at your tables, you've got 10 minutes to do that. there's a verse in there's a word in the Bible and it, it goes like this it says all right and so what's the Greek version of all mean it means all and so the word other you'll notice that Paul didn't define who the other is And so it'll be interesting to hear what your response is going to be to the question. Because when this was addressed to whoever, there was a particular, if you, if you notice the verse, verse 1 of chapter 2, it says, therefore. When you see the word therefore, it implies something happened before. <laughs> yes. And so in Philippians 1.27 it says, Paul actually says, Whatever happens, conduct yourself in a manner worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And conduct speaks about behavior. And so apparently what Paul had addressed was how people were treating others. He didn't define. We know that Jews didn't want to get along with Gentiles. Jews didn't want to get along with Greeks, even though they were Christians. They didn't want to sit with anybody 
We're familiar with that scripture that says, and he was a friend of sinners and tax collectors. And so I know some of the difficulty this morning is you're answering it through a Christian lens or a theological lens of who the other is. And so this morning when I speak about the beloved community, and even when Martin Luther King Jr. speaks about the beloved community, he was not referring between those who are Christians and those who are not Christians. He was talking about everyone. And so, at this table, who is the other for you? The other, uh, the other is everyone, uh, not me. So, so here's the problem and the challenge I have with the work that I do. Is that we struggle with defining who the other is. We might say, no, that rich person. Actually... Black and white. Then you got to coin it down and say, the gay and lesbian. The one who does not have, enjoy your social status. Who is the other? The prostitute. Who is the other that we won't allow into this building? Davina, was that your hand? So in our table, we were saying the other <coughs> is everyone else. But the other is when you get down to it, it's being honest with yourself and saying, whether that person is in my social standing, if it has economic or whatever, whatever, I just don't want to. But we don't ask, why do I not want to? Because we're not ready to deal with why I don't want to get along or why I disagree and not comfortably agree to disagree. Thank you. We looked at it from the other side. We looked at it from the positive side. It is who is the other, is who is closest to you and who moves further away from you. So okay. it's in your circle. So closest to you is Jesus, your spouse, your children, your church, your well, well, I'll disagree, disagree with, with that, that statement. statement. Yeah, but, but, but that's the one way we approach it. We had we had several ways. That's the one way. Just because Davina says, you know, who we are not comfortable with. This is what the first thing we came up. We came up with some others as well. But that's, that's fine. fine. Any other table? Okay. To you, you had a turn already. Oh, yes. You were supposed to move the mic. Mic. <laughs> Anyone else? Let me just say, <laughs> that as a country, remember there was a statement that Martin Luther King made, Sundays is one of the most segregated hours. Do we, and the next question, we can move to the next slide, whoever is moving the next slide. Do we recognize the other? It's one thing defining the other, but do you recognize the other? I see him. I see him. Sorry, your name, Tepo. Yes, I got it right. But do I recognize him as somebody who has value? Acknowledge. So that's different, right? So do we recognize the other? So our table had a lot of discussion about the fact that the other is pe are people who make us uncomfortable for whatever reason, what, whatever reason that is. So do we... No, but that's... But then he changed it. But then he changed it. Yeah. So recognize the other, yes. We, I think we do recognize the other. But what you said was, do we acknowledge the other? Do we recognize that they have worth? That's a different thing altogether. And the answer is no, we don't always. 
this this is a this is a definition of recognize okay identify someone from having encountered them before this is what Alison just said the acknowledge the existence validity or legality that's different Let me just say, neither of you are wrong. It's because I deliberately chose that question and also threw in the other one to say, you, you can see somebody, but do you validate the person? And so, many times in churches, unfortunately, we see people, but we don't validate them. We don't validate the other. Even somebody who is different to you. And as a, as a believer, we, we struggle with the other. We do. Anybody who is different, and then we'll use the nice phrase of, we need to go and evangelize. We just need to get them to Jesus. And then it's Jesus' problem on how they're going to, to work that out. I've done my job. I see them by the other, but it stays there. And so the concept of beloved community is one that is complex and that there's a tension in it. Because constantly, if you look at the New Testament writings, Paul and whoever wrote, there was this constant reference to draw people back to in the way that Jesus did. Let's move to the next question. How does cultural differences impact and influence relationships, both positive and negative, within diverse communities? At your tables. Responses from the table. So I'm going to go from table to table just to get a perspective and not usually the same person that responds. At uh, that table over there, anybody care to uh, have a go? You don't have to give an essay. Who's giving? For me, I'll be speaking on the positive side within diverse communities. It literally just teaches you to adapt, to understand, and respect where somebody else comes from. Yes. <laughs> Any fall from this table? Give it to Esme. No, no. <laughs> 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 it's a, a stand-up. Eh? It's going to be a long time now if I stand up. Um, the, the, there are certain things in culture. It, thank you, Craig. Thank you, Craig. It's a, it's a, it's a thing of respect to everybody. Um, the, 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 there are dimensions in culture that uh, would apply to the community or not apply to the community that you're coming into. And one has to identify what those, what those um, influences and impacts are regarding spirit, the spiritual nature if you come into a church. So we, we respect everyone. We, anybody come into the church, we love them. Christ loved them. Christ loves us. We respect them. Their opinions are outside of us or, or myself. Uh, I understand their opinions. I will, I will listen to opinions. Uh, it doesn't mean to say I agree with them, and it doesn't mean to say I take them on. 
And there are certain things in cultures that have a spiritual nature to them. And you cannot accept them into, for example, a church thing. Um, otherwise, there, there are other laws, that spiritual laws that take effect. Interesting. I'm just going to quickly share the, 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 the impact. So I see negatively the impact is obviously division, 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 division. A positive influence uh, that we noted is, you know, you can see the glory of God through diversity. Just, just see how diverse the world is. But then, then, then we took the discussion way further and see how cultural differences, you know, actually define who we are. There's a guy whom I follow, his name is Vody Borkum. He was also part of the civil rights movement, but more on the Malcolm X side. Uh, then at least he came to repentance. But uh, he said he used to be a black Christian. He was firstly black before he was a Christian. He would define himself as firstly black before he would define himself as a Christian. And now he has to define himself firstly as a Christian before he defines himself as black. <laughs> Next table. Um, on our table, I'll speak of the negative. The negatives comes from a difference in our cultures and the education system that we have in schools. Um, in schools for, in, now, we have one common language, which is English, and all children communicate in English. But then when they go back to their communities, it's a little bit difficult for them because we still have parents who did not get the opportunity to go to school. And your, a child, for instance, my son, maybe he speaks only English and we understand him at home. What happens when he goes out of the house and he gets an instruction from another parent, it gets difficult for him to communicate back to that person. So this shows that not only that we need to use one language or what, we need to show our children that they need to learn one's language so that it can be simple for them to communicate with everybody. Interesting. Um, from this table, we said, um, how does cultural differences impact and influence our relationships is that we are able to learn from each other. Whether you are petty, you are white, but we get an opportunity to learn the different cultures. And you recognize that, oh, this is the petty culture. Oh, this is the closer culture. And that also assists us in expanding our knowledge and being able to accept one another as we are. And some of the acceptance also helps us in adopting some of those cultural differences. For example, one of the people in the table said, you know, as black people, we don't show affection with each other, especially in the public spaces. But when we come here and we see the white people showing affection to one another, we also adopt that. You know what? We see it as something that is positive. We see it as something that we can also do. So that also uh, helps us in accepting one another. On the negative side, we said the there is communication barriers because there is English, there is other languages. For instance, if I can go and stand at the podium and say, what what don't do, the, Mr. John would have got it immediately, what I meant, but the other person would not have gotten it. What was she saying? What did she mean by that? But I think that there's communication barriers because we already understand because we are from a certain community and that's how we speak. And again, 
we said on the negative side, there is a lot of compromise as well because I am in this particular space with other people. I must compromise and not let one, two, three come out so that they won't see it. Thank you. Thank you for everybody's input. And so the diversity of opinion and the diversity of understanding is very different. The fact that we have 11 official languages in our country says a lot about who we are as a people. And that is positive. Sorry, you got something to say? 12, sorry. That's only the recognized ones. There are a lot more that can fit on the page. Um, and so I want to mention something that Edith mentioned, which will go into the next part of our session is, is one, we spoke one about the recognizing and validation. Right now we have a situation where people don't feel recognized or seen, or people don't feel validated. Whether that's black or white, or petty, or Zulu. We can see it play itself out in our communities. Black people in South Africa are not homogenous as they are. They are tribes. White people are not homogenous as they are. Because there's English speaking whites and Afrikaans speaking whites. <laughs> you know? So I lived in Mahalis for six years. Years as a person of color living in Mahalis. You know what? How I felt every time I went into a community meeting, I thought the Anglo Boer War was still going on. And so, as a beloved community, as community ministries, as people of faith, if we don't recognize those differences, we struggle here in community ministries. There are people that don't feel seen, don't feel heard, because there's an assumption about the culture of community ministries. So if... I know there was a deliberate attempt by whoever was to call it community ministry so that we reflect that. So my question is, do we really reflect that? Is there an acknowledgement of the other within our space? So, now I'm going to get very academic. <laughs> Go to the next slide, please. Cultural intelligence. What is that? We've heard, all heard of emotional intelligence. <laughs> yes, Google it. <laughs> emotional intelligence, all it says is, is your ability to engage with another person or your environment in a healthy way so that when you are faced with any extreme circumstances, you carry away in a way that is not harmful to yourself and to others. So, sure, I must take notes for myself. <laughs> so emotional intelligence essentially says, and I'm paraphrasing, is that it's your ability as a person to carry yourself, that when you are faced with certain situations and people, that you don't bring harm to yourself or the other person in that situation. For example, if somebody shouts at me and calls me, and I'm going to say it publicly, kafa. I have two ways to respond. I can respond in a way that, with violence, in the way that I respond, or I can respond in a way that, will not cause more harm to that person or to me. However, the constraint lies in my ability to say, you will not call me that again, because it's offensive. And so cultural intelligence says this. 
is the ability to relate to others and interact effectively across cultures. Cultural intelligence requires placing the interests, feelings, and cultures of other people into context. So, when somebody behaves in a certain way, you're like, why are they doing that? There's context. Culture. Everybody grew up differently. Everybody spoke differently. This means learning that people in different cultures have different socially acceptable responses. Interesting. I remember I did some work with the Bakhatla tribe out in Northwest. In my Western idea, I would come into the meeting and the chief is not there. And everybody is there. And, and I would say, why is the meeting not starting? Culture dictates the meeting will start when the chief steps into the room. So even if you question, ask the question, why isn't the chief there? Culture dictates in that place the meeting will start when the chief is there. I waited for three hours. You, according to you, it might be rude. Right? Lack of respect, your Western idea of thinking of time. When the chief appeared, guess what? I was one of few non-speaking Tswana people in the room. Out of respect for the culture, guess what? I said, speak in your language. Just because I am English and I need to be in the room. And out of that, they responded by saying, we acknowledge the respect, we will speak in Tswana, but we will interpret for you. So, understanding context is important. Agreed. So, let me read that line again. This means learning that people in different cultures have different socially acceptable responses, working styles, and lifestyles that can differ from the place for which you work, play, and fellowship. So, when we talk about the beloved community, this community here, you might say we have our own culture, but actually we live in a diverse community of people that when we go outside, it's very different. What rules govern? Again, I go back to Philippians. It says, in humility, consider the other higher than yourself. So, would I rather want to be right or wrong? So, in this thing of black and white, right and wrong, we, get, we miss each other in translation. So, cultural intelligence is the cornerstone of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Those are big words. That requires like a six-day workshop. <laughs> diversity, equity, and inclusion. It's not enough to have diverse groups within a church or organization. We must possess the skills and awareness to collaborate and work effectively. Cultural intelligence goes beyond awareness. It equips us with the ability to adapt, interact, and thrive in multicultural environments, fostering an atmosphere of respect, understanding, and collaboration. And so what's the impact for us? The ability to break stereotypes. It helps dispel stereotypes and biases, promoting a more inclusive mindset by appreciating the nuances of various cultures. Effective cross-cultural communication. It equips individuals with skills to communicate across cultural boundaries, reducing misunderstanding. Cultivating empathy. Isn't that a Christian trait? Conflict resolution. In diverse communities, it aids in resolving conflicts by identifying cultural factors and offering strategies to find common ground. Let's go to the next slide. 
So what define, what are the pillars of a beloved community? Secure attachment. What is secure attachment? A way I can explain that when a baby cries and it latches onto its mother's breast, that baby feels secure. Are we a community that reflects secure attachment for people who fellowship with us? Is it a place of belonging? Are people affirmed? Do we see? Do we validate? And do we have fun? And so we're not going to sit around tables and answer this question, but the question I'm going to leave with you is, how do we value the other? And so in closing, Philippians 2, 1 to 8, it says, Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from His love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interest, but each of you to the interest of the others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider, consider equality with God something to be used for his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. And so my prayer is that we will reflect the beloved community here in community ministries, in our homes, in our cities, and in our country. And so, Craig and the leadership team here, I would suggest that we actually grapple with this further. Because it's something that needs to be addressed in terms of our country and where we find ourselves. And so over the next few weeks, we will release some material for the connect groups to actually engage further in conversation. And if needs be, we can actually do another workshop like this again if time allows. Thank you very much.